So the two of you, no, no pressure, but the two of you better come up with some pretty good friggin' questions right now. <laughs> <laughs> also, we will have and job. And we'll have questions coming in yeah. from the person. Yeah, yeah. No? Yeah. No, because I don't even know what we're discussing. Right? And you can ask some questions, too. I always too. do. Oh, they can see our transaction with Silicon Alter. It could be the least. Oh, it's going to go five, four, three, two, one. Three, three, two, one. one time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they have to get approved. They'll move on and then get approved, too. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our class today. We have Craig Foley here, who is a new member of Lair Realty Partners. Welcome, Craig. Thank you, Susan. Craig is our uh, Chief Sustainability Officer, and today he is going to give an introduction of all that he is and all that he can do and talk about uh, solar panels and green building and just get us all to be thinking about that and please send your questions in through joe and we will get those answered thank you thanks and we have a couple of uh live people here today as well so i, I guess um you know I, i've been part of a process that was funded through the massachusetts clean energy center mass cec to develop a course on solar pv in the residential real estate transaction um and, and uh, we're, we're in the process of releasing that for continuing ed units. Uh, and at some point uh, at Lair, uh, we're, we're, we're looking at how we can include continuing ed into the courses that Susan's been working with as well. Um, but I guess just to start off with, we've got uh, Courtney, right? And yep. Susan in the room and, and Joe and, uh, Su and, and Susan Lewis in the room and obviously our people in Akushna, do, do you guys have any questions? I mean, I've got a PowerPoint that will cover just about everything that we need to know with solar PV and the residential real estate transaction. But do you guys have, well, why are you here? Why, why did you come to a solar PV class? Have you, have you dealt with, with solar in a residential transaction before? What have you heard in the marketplace about dealing with, with, with this kind of system on a home what is it what do you what are the questions that you have to start off with i guess well if it's a lease on the solar panels isn't it harder to transfer over in a transaction so the question i don't know can everybody hear courtney's questions as well so yeah great question At lease is it more difficult to transfer there's absolutely um some issues that you need to know with a lease with a what we call a third party owned system so leases are, are kind of run in two different directions, right? You can lease the solar PV panels from a third party installer, but more frequently what happens in this state is you enter into a power purchase agreement. So the third party installer puts the, 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 the solar panels, the power plant on your rooftop, and you pay for the electricity that's generated at a significantly cheaper rate than what you'd be paying for that same amount of electricity from your from the utility company that you're working with. So it, there's two different ways, but both of them fit into the third party owned category. And then there's host owned solar PV when you own the panels outright. And there's definitely a di di different mechanism for moving through the transaction mm -hmm. that our agents need to know about uh, when they're transacting these kinds of panels. And is it more difficult? Um, it's it's it's, uh, I'm not sure it's more difficult, but there are different challenges. Three or four or five years ago, when, when these uh, third party owned systems were transacting, there were definitely screw ups that happened in the transaction process. And we'll talk about what those are as we work our way through the course today. But that's a, that's a great question to start off with. Should, shouldn't um, listing agents um, find that information out beforehand so they can let the Absolutely. buyers know? Because I had taken buyers out and yeah. purchased a house that had solar panels and that became a, a, it was a surprise yeah. when we got to that point that they had to be approved yeah. before they could transfer it over so it was more paperwork. And, That's an um, awesome question, Susan. So the shouldn't everybody know before mm -hmm. there's an offer made, right. you know, mm -hmm. upload this information into the MLS. So I just want to, I'm going to just share with you quickly some, so this is kind of the best practices of listing homes with solar PV, right? Mm -hmm. With, with host owned solar PV, we absolutely know they add value to the home. In fact, there's a, a mechanism for, for including it in the appraisal process. We're going to talk a lot about that mechanism as we work our way through here. 
but you both, and I'll, and we're going to post these on on uh, Jossel yep. somewhere. Jossel in the yep. library under training. Yeah. So I have three handouts, all you folks in Akushna, um, that are important to this process. Kind of the best practices of listing these types of homes. One of them is a letter that if you take your green designation and you go to the greenresourcecouncil.org uh, website, it is available for everybody to be able to download. And we'll make sure that that gets into, maybe even dot .loop would be a good place for some of these materials oh, as absolutely. well, right? Sure. Um, this one, so this letter, do you see this letter, Susan and, and Courtney right here? What, what do you suppose that this letter does? This is from a specific project that I sold on Fort Hill in Boston four condos that were the cutting edge of sustainable real estate. You know, they were LEED Platinum certified, uh, four units that had a 31.68 solar PV system on the two rooftops. They were beyond net zero. Their HERS scores were negative 14 and negative 22 for the four condo units. So these were really the, the, the leading hedge of, of, of development in, in the United States, really. What, what is this? document say this was uploaded susan into the mls right because i want to see all of this information just as you at you know were wondering mm -hmm. shouldn't this stuff be in the multiple listing service absolutely it should be what does this document do what am i asking for here with this document you know we can't ask for a specific appraiser right mm -hmm. due to dodd frank mm -hmm. right uh of, you know we have to have an arms or the lenders need to have an arms link but as a listing agent, I can absolutely require, and, we, and this was uploaded into the MLS, that we have a qualified appraiser to, to, to be hired for this project. And if you go through the Appraisal Institute website, there are a specific group of appraiser, they're, they're on this document, uh, where to find it, where they've gone through the valuation of sustainable buildings residential program. We have 11 of those appraisers here in the Commonwealth right now. We've got a bunch more that have gone two thirds of the way through the pro process and, and the big part of that process is learning how to value solar PV in the residential transaction. So one of the tools that we're gonna be looking at today, one of the handouts, I don't know if you can see this at Kushnet, but um, one of the handouts comes from a tool called pvvalue.com called the pv value tool you can find it at pvvalue.com and this tool for host owned solar pv gives us a very very specific contributory value added contributory value to the comps that you use so this uses an income approach again this is completely accepted in the marketplace it's just that nobody knows it but specialists like me that are doing this you need to get the qualified appraiser to understand how to use this PV value tool. So if you have a home that has host-owned solar PV, you want to be uploading this document that says you want a qualified appraiser, and as a condition for accepting that offer, you want the buyer to initial this page so that they realize that they're gonna to have to get a qualified appraiser, move it to the mortgage originator, and hopefully they get it to the AMC, the appraisal management company, to, to bring the right appraiser to the to to the uh, to, to meet me after the property is under agreement, those appraisers know how to use this tool. They've been trained to use this tool, the PV value tool, that adds contributory value. And you can see this one's for 156 Highland Street, one of the first units that sold. The additional contributory value was almost thirty nine thousand dollars. So we had comps, obviously but we didn't have a good set of LEED certified comps, um, but we had comps of new construction that we could use. But this tool added on top of those comps the additional contributory value. In this specific case, the first unit that sold, it, it, the, the agreement between the seller and buyer was for $680,000. We had the qualified appraiser come through, they did the analysis of, of lead homes in Boston, which do sell at a greater price per square foot between 20 to $25 more per square foot. And again, that qualified appraiser knows how to do that, analyze that. And we had the contributory value of the solar PV. Now remember, that home came to an agreement between seller and buyer of $680,000. The appraisal came in at $690,000. 
Yeah. Um, so it increases the appraisal. Correct. I, I feel like it would be something that would decrease the appraisal because it doesn't look good. Yeah, that's a, that's a common misperception. Mm. Thanks for bringing that up. That is absolutely wrong. Yeah. So beauty's in the eye of the beholder, first of all, Courtney. I look at a home with solar PV on a rooftop and I think it's the sexiest thing on the face mm -hmm. of the earth. That's just me, okay? I mean, I'm a little crazy, I, I guarantee you, but that's, just, that's the way I feel, right? Okay. But no matter how you feel, and, and you know, we had buyers, you know, we had, we, so we were competing against a new construction project down the street that was listed at the quote unquote correct new construction price in that neighborhood in Boston at 375 a square foot. We were listed at 450 a square foot. So we were all, you know, the developer and I, you know, you know, we were nervous about how the, how the, the buying public was going to receive this. We put all four of our units under agreement before two of their seven units went under agreement and we got the 450 a square foot. So we were seeing, you know, and, and I can guarantee you, you know, the, the way we listed it, I think the way we developed a marketing plan for it was, was, uh, was a good one. Mm -hmm. um, but I saw that 20 to 25% of the buyers coming to open houses and showings were there primarily because they thought the sustainability part of it was really interesting and cool. Now you need somebody there to be able to deliver what that message is and how the how it functions, which one part of that is solar PV, which is what this class is about today. Mm -hmm. But that's a great question about, you know, doesn't it look ugly? Our biases as real estate agents, we really need to remove those, you know, from the process. Mm -hmm. There is no question that we have uh, a, a a, a way to do this in the marketplace that's accepted in the marketplace, mm -hmm. you know, because it adds income for the homeowner. And we're going to talk about the income part. Now, this is for host owned solar PV. Remember, we talked about third party owned mm -hmm. and host owned solar PV. Mm -hmm. Fannie, Mae, Fannie Mae has some very specific guidance about, about how you deal with each of them. First of all, third party owned solar PV is is uh, personal property so there can't be any added contributory value in third-party owned systems because they're personal property for host owned systems even though they're both attached to the rooftop Fannie Mae's guidance is equally clear it's real property and it needs to be appropriately valued in the marketplace and this is the tool for the appropriate valuation in the marketplace so the solar panels have to be owned in that case? They yes. can't be leased? Yes, exactly right. Gotcha. So 40% in Massachusetts of, of the solar panels that you see, the 90,000 that are on homes here in the Commonwealth now, 40% of them are host owned, 60% are third party owned. So that's the first question you ask when you walk into a home where you're having a, a, a listing appointment and the homeowner has solar PV on their home. Question number one, is it leased or is it owned? Because they're gonna be asking you, doesn't this add value to my property? They, they see the benefits of solar PV in their utility savings on a month to month basis. But with third party owned systems, the correct answer is we can't add any contributory value because Fannie Mae considers it personal property. But if it's host owned, if the homeowner owns it, we can absolutely add value because it's real property at that point and we have a method for doing this. So if you and I, Courtney, before this class, if we got called to a listing, it will be helpful for everybody. Understand different financing options. So we've already talked about them a little bit, the difference between third party owned and host owned solar PV. That's a big takeaway from this class that I want you guys to really understand uh, having left here. And if, identify the essential system information in the MLS. MLS PIN has added two of the data fields that we want in there in the electric uh, uh, section, whether it's owned or leased. So those are two places in PIN right now where you can actually find solar PV data fields. We're exploring, I, I work with PIN on this topic and we're working on adding the additional data fields that RISO, the Real Estate Standards Organization, wants for solar PV in, in there. 
So we'll, we'll be adding more of those data fields, I think sometime uh, mid-year or so. Understand the best practices for marketing a home with solar PV. I'm gonna to try to keep you out of real estate jail from some of the things that I've seen the way listing agents have put information about solar PV in the marketplace that just make me think, oh my goodness, they're putting everybody at risk by saying some of the things that I've seen in, in, in the MLS. And we're gonna talk about this solar PV valuation tool, right? PV value tool, found at pvvalue.com, free to use free to use. Get on there, try it out. We'll go through that in a little bit. So PV, right? I've gone, gone going on to the next slide there for you guys. PV, what does that mean? I've been talking about it all the time. PV, PV, PV. It stands for photovoltaic. So we have enough energy reaching the planet every day to power the entire planet for a year in the sun's photons that reach our planet. So that's the photo part. And we turn those that those photons into voltage, into electricity, so that they can power our homes. And in some cases, powering homes completely. Those are called net zero energy homes, and we'll talk about those in a later slide. So moving on now to the next slide, solar PV versus solar thermal. There's two potential panels that you will see on rooftops. So you guys with me? You mm -hmm. yeah, forward? yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, in, in this, this photo that you see of, here of this house, those two types of panels are on there. In the center, up at the top, those are solar thermal panels. They create water to either completely, heat hot water to completely or partially uh, make sure the hot water system is, is, is uh, produced with renewable energy. The rest of those panels are around the solar thermal panels are what we're gonna be talking today uh, about. Those are the solar photovoltaic panels, PV panels. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Yep. Next frame. So why is this suddenly part of the real estate discussion? Well, I've moved on to the 2005 frame now, and you can see in 2005, there were 297 solar PV systems installed across the state completely with an aggregate total of 1.7 megawatts of capacity. That's where we were in 2005. In 2010, you can see we make a big leap forward. All of a sudden there's 2,778 solar PV systems installed with 41.6 megawatts of, of aggregate capacity. So what happened between 2005 and 2010? Well, in 2008, Green Communities Act was passed, which was the legislation that, that uh, put, uh, into, in, in, put into the marketplace this idea of net metering, where if I put solar PV on my rooftop, there's gonna be times when it's producing more power than the home can use. So what happens with that power? It gets, it gets sent back to the utility grid and the customer with our good net metering policy that we have in the state gets a full refund for every kilowatt hour that they produce. So a lot of times, May, June, July, August, September, the, the solar PV systems are producing more power than the homeowner's using, and they get credits back in the winter months when it's not producing as much, right? By May 2013, we had, we had a goal in 2008 when GCA was passed to get to 400 megawatts of installed solar PV by 2017. And everybody, when that legislation was passed, thought, well, that's cute. The Greenies have a goal. We'll never get there. Nobody thought that that was feasible, right? And by May 2013, we had reached that, that 400 megawatt goal. So this was growing much faster than anybody ever anticipated in the state, partly because we have a good net metering policy. So then we get to May 2013, and the legislature says, well, let's make a really crazy goal, let's get to 1,600 megawatts of installed solar PV capacity by 2020. By 2015, we had over 43,000 homes in the state with solar PV systems on those rooftops. And you can see we're a good way towards that 1,600 megawatt goal with over 1,000 megawatts installed. Uh, end of August, I was, um, uh, uh, where do we go to? Yeah, August 2018, when I was at Mass CC, we were looking at the numbers and we had almost 86,000 homes with solar PV and we had 
already reached that 1600 megawatt goal, we'd, we'd got to 2200 megawatts of installed capacity. We're, we're increasing at a rate of 1,000 to 1,500 a month, so we're over 90,000 homes in the state with solar PV on them. If you haven't been involved in a transaction with solar PV, you will be. I can, I can guarantee you with the rate of growth that's out there. You can see over 230 communities have over 5% or more of the owner-occupied homes having solar PV installed. 40% of the systems, as I mentioned earlier, are host-owned systems, 60% our third party owned systems. We're starting to see more and more homeowners uh, make the investment to host owned systems, which is great from, from my perspective. Uh, state set capacity to add an additional new 1600 megawatts of installed capacity uh, with this new SMART initiative, which is the, the, the third uh, um, state incentive for solar PV. We'll touch on that a little bit a little bit later. But so it, this stuff, the long and short of this is that this is growing much faster than anybody expected. Why, why is that? Well, we'll talk about some of the drivers, but definitely it's just, you know, this, we're past the tree hugger phase of the marketplace with this. This is just a smart economic move that homeowners are making to get control of utility costs. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. This is a comparison of host-owned versus third-party owned systems. Uh, why is solar growing so quickly? What are the drivers in the marketplace? Well, you can see, unfortunately, in the Northeast here, we have some of the highest utility prices in the United States. And on top of that, the, the, uh, the marketplace, the, the electric mar electricity marketplace, the power marketplace is very volatile. So if you look at that second graph that I'm on right now, at the end of 2014, beginning of 2015, you see a big price spike there. That was when our two largest investor-owned utilities increased the, the price for um, homeowners by 26 and 31% uh, for electricity costs. Very hard to budget when you're dealing with that kind of volatility in the marketplace. And we have high costs, so consumers are saying, well, here's a way to control both the volatility and the cost by making an investment up front where, I, where, where I'm getting clean energy and I'm getting that electricity for free if I own the system outright, right? So just a, it's a, just economic drivers that are, that are driving this. Here's an in, interesting graph from it, um, how solar PV has, has transitioned worldwide. And you can see back in 75, the price per watt installed was over a hundred bucks per watt installed. In Massachusetts now, you can typically get a solar PV installation for a residential property under $4 per watt installed right now. Uh, but you can see as the price of solar PV dropped around 2006, 2007, 2008, there was a point where installed capacity worldwide shot up. That was when solar PV became competitive in the marketplace across the world. Um, this is another driver, the incentives that are out there supporting solar PV. So in Massachusetts, uh, we, we, and federally, we have an income tax credit, which is a pretty in, in, incredible credit. All of us are independent contractors, right, as, as uh, agents. So we all have a tax appetite, right? With the federal investment tax credit right now is 30% of the installed price of the solar PV. So if you put uh, a, a system that costs $20,000 on your rooftop, you multiply that by 30% and you get to reduce what you owe the federal government the next year by $6,000. That's a driver in and of itself. I've got a property that we're working on in Weston right now, which is a luxury property with a 14.6 kW solar PV system that we're gonna transfer the ownership to whoever buys it. They're gonna be able to take that 30% investment tax credit for a, for a pretty large system on their rooftop. That's a driver in the marketplace. On top of that, Massachusetts gives an additional $1,000 investment tax credit are from what you owe the Massachusetts uh, income tax as well. So you can see that between the $6,000 and the $1,000 off that $20,000 system, now you've got your net down to, what is that? 13,000 13, bucks is all of a sudden your net. 
On top of that, there's a property tax exemption or abatement in Massachusetts. So, and there, there's some communities that don't get this, but under state law, we know that solar PV adds value, host-owned solar PV adds value to the property. But there's a 20-year exemption on that added contributory value for homeowners that own systems in the Commonwealth. So you don't pay extra taxes, even though we know it increases value. And then there's a sales tax exemption in Massachusetts, so you don't pay any sales tax on purchasing these systems as, as well. On top of that, Massachusetts has some very specific incentives in terms of how the state incentivizes them. Uh, the state incentives are, are fall into two categories. The SREC program, Solar Renewable Energy Credits, we're gonna talk a more about that later, and this new program called the SMART program. I know that this is a lot to take in. This is, you need to have kind of a, you know, not only a real estate license, but a degree in property management, you know, energy management and procurement to get this stuff down. But the reality is, this is what you need to know if you want to list these kinds of homes. You need to know all of these factors to get this right. And under Article 11 of our Code of Ethics, of NAR's Code of Ethics, it requires knowledge and competence of agents when they list a specific type of property. This is a specific type of property. There will be a Code of Ethics violation at some point for someone not understanding the process of listing this stuff. That's that's the biggest concern is us as agents understanding it and then explaining it to clients. Yeah. Especially if you're representing a buyer and a buyer wants to look at a house that has solar panels, where do you begin as the yeah. agent to even try to get them to understand what it is all about if they've never known anything about it? Well, I would say take this class, wouldn't you, Susan, to start yes, off with, right? That's why we're doing this, right? Absolutely. And, you know, I, I will say this is a part of the market that I specialize in, right? I sold nine homes last year involved in nine transactions that had solar PV on the, on the rooftop. And some of those were from uh, outside of the company that I used to work with because I would get referrals from agents that were listing properties and I would take a referral fee, but guide them through the process mm -hmm. of listing these types of homes and guide them through correctly, putting it into the multiple listing service and even meeting the appraiser at the, at, for, for the appraisal of the property to make sure the, the appraiser is doing this right. So if anybody within our company feels uncomfortable with this and they, you know, we can work out a, a referral agreement to make that work, absolutely. And I can guarantee you if you, you know, if Susan, if you're listing one of these homes for the first time and you want me to help tag along with that, mm -hmm. The second time you go to list one of these homes, you'll feel a lot more comfortable. You won't need me the second time. You know. What about having um, some type of literature or brochure to, to give the client, just like we do when we, we try to educate them about home inspection, yeah. or, or lead paint. I yeah. mean, we're not we're not experts in this. Yeah. And it'd be nice to have something that would have everything. I think that's a great idea. Down, down yeah. For us. So yeah. That has Lear branding on it. I love that. Are you writing that down, Susan? Yes, great, great. I think that's a great idea. Um, thank you for making my workload longer now, Susan. I really appreciate that. But I think that's a great idea. Absolutely. So, moved on to an, uh, the next frame in the PowerPoint, the Pew Research Center uh, research. This is another driver in the marketplace. You know. Over the last couple of years, for whatever reason, NAR Research is supporting this as well, is that we're seeing consumers more and more aware of their own environmental footprint, right? You know, I drive a Prius, right? Because it gets 50 miles to the gallon, but also Craig Foley as a consumer is aware of his own environmental footprint, something that I care about, right? And we're seeing more and more consumers caring about that for whatever reason it is, but we're, we're seeing big jumps in research of consumers getting that they're part of an, a potential environmental energy solution rather than being part of a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, next uh, frame goes on to an Accenture, Accenture uh, uh, study that they did. Uh, uh, consumer demand for new energy related products and services is high, especially for millennials. Uh, they found that if you drop to that, that uh, second paragraph, 56% of millennials 
twice as many people uh, as people over 55, I'm 56, so that's my age, are likely to sign up for solar panels in the next five years. Now, we just gotta get millennials to buy houses, that's step number one, but if they buy a house, 56% of them wanna put solar PV on their house. And, and I think, you know, that 28%, I mean, if half of the uh, people my age are interested in doing it as well, that's pretty compelling numbers in and of itself, right? This is a, another allure, particularly for the New Hampshire agents in the live free or die state, is to go completely off the grid, right? And in order to do that, you would need some kind of battery storage system. So this is a picture of the Tesla Powerwall. That's the most popular of the battery storage systems that are out there. You would need something to collect the excess solar PV production that you're doing during the day so that you can power your home at night or when the sun's not shining. That's where the battery storage solutions come in, right? And where you could legitimately go off grid, you could disconnect from the grid. Just if you have an individual customer that's asking you about that, you wanna make them understand that, you know, you can certainly do that with this type of technology, but under Fannie Mae's current guidance right now, you can't sell an off grid home into the secondary mortgage market. So it may limit their mm -hmm. opportunities further on down the road when they go to sell. Now. You know, as this market continues to expand, Fannie Mae may relook at this guidance mm -hmm. at some point and say off-grid homes are accepted, but right now they are not, so that's the guidance that we have to give. Make sense? Any questions about that? What do you mean by off-grid, sorry? So being so this this office building is connected to the grid. There's wires coming in, right? Through okay. through through the we could completely disconnect from the grid if we had a really panels. If we had a really efficient building envelope, we had solar PV on it and some kind of energy storage system sure. where okay. the home or business could completely be, be reliant solely on the solar PV system. And there's a certain attraction to that, but the, again, the guidance is right now that that type of home or business couldn't be sold into the secondary mortgage market. Great question, keep on asking them because there's a lot of information here. Uh, I'll wait. You with me? Yeah. Everybody good? All right. Next, net zero energy homes. Any of you heard of a net, yep, yeah, look at that. Millennium. My friend Joe Foley, same last name. <laughs> Foley's know all about this stuff. That's really the key, isn't it, Joe? We get it, Foley's get it. So Joe knows what a net zero energy home is. You've heard of it. Any of you guys heard net zero energy home? The project we had in Townsend. Yeah. That I told you our agent had. He did a small development with it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was Carter Scott's development, right? Yeah, I know Carter, absolutely. I mean he's he's been a leader as a builder in this field for several, several years. He's he's an internet he's a he's an international expert on this. Yeah. So the same the project that we were doing in Fort Hill had double stud wall construction. Mm -hmm. So in it's same thing that Carter used. So 12 inch walls filled with dense pack cellulose to get to R42 on the exterior mm -hmm. walls. We'll talk about building science at a separate time. We wanna focus mostly on solar PV, but that's an essential element for the home that you see here on this right. frame. You need a really efficient building envelope. The home has to be running completely on solar PV, right, on electricity. So this home, uh, had induction cooktop ovens in it as well, which is a, a, a cooktop oven that's electric that's really getting a lot of play in the marketplace right now. Uh, they were connected to the grid, uh, but they were producing more energy than they were using on an annual basis in this home because they had a really tight building envelope and they had solar PV on their home. So let's just run through some numbers. I want you to run through some numbers in your head for me. What does it cost you, what, Joe, you, you, you own a home or you? No. Apartment? You're one of the millennials that we got to get to. Yeah. Courtney, you own a home? Not yet. Yeah, see, there's two right there. Susan, you own a home? No. Susan, you own a home? I own a home? I own two. So let's add up quickly, even for your apartments, in your head, what does it cost you on an annual basis to heat your apartment or your home? So think about that for an annual basis, right? Annual. The winter, yeah, on an annual basis. So for 12 months, you know, December, January, February, March are gonna be the hard months, you know, natural gas, oil, propane, really expensive. Just run those numbers quickly in your head. I'm not gonna ask you what they are. I'm not gonna embarrass you, but, but right there, is it 
$2,000? Is it $3,000? Is it $3,500? What, what is it? Write it down on a piece of paper for me because I'm going to ask you to write three numbers down. All right? Or, of course, Courtney pulls out her phone. She doesn't write things on paper. She, she's <laughs> I'm a calculating wonder. it. Yeah. So, yeah, you're calculating it. Good. So that's, that's one number. Now, for a year, what does it cost for your electricity bills? Is it 100 a month, 150 a month during the summer when you've got AC? Does it spike to 200, 250 a month? Give me a rough number for the year for electricity bills. Everybody got a number? Mm -hmm. All right. Rough number, Susan. No, That's all we need. I don't even pay. My husband does all. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> we'll s how, how big's your home? Uh, pretty big. It's a four, three bedroom. Yeah. Office. Yeah. AC. Yeah. Yeah. So we're gonna give you two hundred dollars a month on average okay. for your home. All right. Mm -hmm. So you can add these up. Now you take one of your cars to the gas station, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Every week. Mm -hmm. Twice every two weeks. Once every three weeks, how many times do you go to the gas station? And how much does it cost you to fill your tank with gas? Try to figure that out for a month. Now multiply it by 12, so we got an annual number. What do you got for a number? Got something in your head? What does that have to do with heating your home? Well, oh. stay with me. Okay. Stay with me, Courtney. Great question. <laughs> stay with me, though. So these people not only have a really energy efficient home, uh, and they've got solar PV, but they've got an electric vehicle, Courtney, as well, that they're powering, right? Through the home, right? Through, through the solar PV system on their rooftop. It costs them a total for one year to heat, light, cool their home, power all their gadgets and appliances, and to run an electric vehicle, 434 bucks for the entire year. Yeah! That's what I'm saying right there. Wow. Absolutely. That's the value of a net zero energy home. Low operating costs, extremely low operating costs for homeowners. And there's value there. There's value that appraisers understand how to value in the marketplace. But again, we need the qualified appraiser, the appraiser that's gone through the valuation of sustainable buildings residential program. Right? And one of the other tools that we have that those types of, of appraisers need is something called the Appraisal Institute's Green Residential and Energy Efficient Addendum. This was an addendum that was created in 2011 to deal with the types of homes that I'm selling. LEED certified homes, homes with really low HERS scores, homes with solar PV on them. Um, and, and there's a there's a set of information that qualified appraisers need and it comes on this addendum. This was created because the Uniform Residential Appraisal Report, the URAR, only has one line item on it that says energy efficient items. And so for the homes that I was selling in Fort Hill or this project I'm doing in Weston, it totally doesn't cover what that is. That's why this addendum was created. So when you're listing these types of homes, this is another piece that you want uploaded into the MLS as well, Susan, yeah. right? See, these are the best practices for listing these types of homes. That's what we're talking about right here. You're, and, and I would add to that, you know, if I have a listing where the home, homeowners lease the solar PV, I want to get the power purchase agreement and with the seller's uh, obviously consent, mm -hmm. we want to upload that power purchase agreement into the, into the, into the MLS mm -hmm. so that when you're making an offer, we can assume that the buyer and their agents have already reviewed it and it doesn't cause problems later on when you try to introduce that between the offer and the purchase and sales and you got an attorney going, what is going on with this thing? Nobody told us about it, right? You can, you can solve a lot of the problems with transparency up front on this topic. Mm -hmm. I think your question, you know, it's, it's been a long way to answer your question, but your question was an excellent one right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So net zero energy homes, is that cool or what? Yes. Do we love them now? Absolutely. <laughs> Are we having a good time? Is this fun? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. You hearing that, Akushnit? We're having a good time here. <laughs> Uh, potential impact on home value. So I've, I've moved to the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab slide now. Now we have 
Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory is one of our 16 uh, national laboratories in the United States funded by the U.S. Department of Energy. They've done a ton of research on solar PV in the residential marketplace. And they've shown over and over and over again that there is increased value uh, for host-owned solar PV. Um, there's just, we have so much data on this now, it's kind of ridiculous. Here's some realtor perceptions of PV value. So I don't know if you know this, but, but uh, NAR now has a sustainability advisory group and we have a full-time director of sustainability at National Association of Realtors. Her name's Amanda Stinton. She's doing some great stuff. And in 2017, we produced our first realtor sustainability report. This is the 2018 version. We'll be producing the next one in April. I think it will be published. But here's some realtor perceptions about solar PV from that report. You know, this went, we, we poll realtors nationally across the United States on this topic. 80% of resp respondents said uh, properties with solar panels are available in their, in their marketplace nationwide, right? 39% said properties with solar panels increased value. And that is correct if it's a host-owned solar PV system. It's not correct if it's third-party owned, right? If, if it's leased, mm -hmm. right? 32% has said it has no effect on value. That is correct when it's third-party owned. It doesn't have any contributory value effect in the marketplace because it's real property, because it's personal property. It's not real property. 11% said it decreased value. Now, you know, I understand that perception because of what Courtney brought up earlier. You know, buyers might think it looks ugly on the rooftop. Now, I missed the class, Courtney, and I've taken a lot of real estate classes where, uh, I guess you got this class where asphalt shingles add aesthetic value to a home. I missed that class yeah. somehow. Uh, so again, solar PV, super sexy to me, I, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. But, but we do know from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab studies if there, is that there is, that, that is an incorrect answer that across the United States, we've not seen even with leased solar PV systems that it has decreased value on a home nationally. 19% of the realtors were honest and said that they didn't know what the answer was. Um, but, but so in many cases, most of these answers can or, or may not be correct. The market's responding to this. So Zillow has this thing called Sun Number where a buyer can look at a home and calculate the potential for solar PV on a rooftop. Google has the same kind of, uh, of, of algorithm called Project Sunroof, which I think is far superior than Zillow's, where you can search for the solar PV potential on a potential home. Now, Zillow and Google wouldn't have created mapping and algorithms to be able to do this if they didn't see that buyers weren't interested in it, right? They wouldn't have invested in it. Yeah, Susan? I now get it. I just sold a home in Chelmsford in the fall to a millennial couple and he wasn't saying it to me out loud, but he was looking for a home. With a south facing roof. Yeah. Yeah. So, exactly right. Yeah. yeah. See? Now you know the tools when you start to pick up those clues about where to send them to. And it was, it was a, a ranch and it was wide open. There were no trees anywhere close to yeah. the house. Yeah. So, Exactly right. He's my type of guy. I should have been selling him. You should have been referring him to me. Uh, that last resource, though, I just want to highlight is a really important one. EnergySage.com. Energy Sage is a Boston company, Massachusetts company, that is doing some really progressive stuff in the marketplace. So I, I get questions from my old firm that I used to work with, and I'm sure I'll get questions from agents here of Craig, my past buyer wants to put solar PV on their home, who should I send them to, right? Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I work with some solar PV installers. I know exactly who I would go to for my home because I've worked with them. But I like not to uh, uh, um, kind of, it, you know, allow myself into a liability state, mm -hmm. right? I don't want to go to real estate jail. So I don't like to answer that question for people that have other buyers that I'm not directly connected to. So I send them to energysage.com. Energy Sage is great. If you plug in your zip code, 
and and uh, you ask for for some quotes for solar PV, they'll send you four or five vetted quotes that Energy Sage has has done of installers in the state that can give them you know third party owned possibilities, host owned possibilities. So that's a great resource when you get asked that question of who should I use. Send them to Energy Sage. Put the liability on Energy Sage. Don't take it yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Susan. Okay, two questions. I experienced this myself about four or five years ago where the guy was going door to door trying to sell the panels. And I had two things in my mind. One was if at the time you were only thinking of staying in your home for a couple of years, would you bother making that move on your own? I think my concern, and again, was probably coming from a realtor's angle, was how was it going to be perceived by the future buyer? Right. And the other question I have is, if someone is older, let's say they've lived in their home for a while and they're 60 years old, let's say, mm -hmm. and they think about it. I don't think that's older that's anymore, no, being 56. But, but, yeah. but, but the point is, if they're going to do a 20 year lease, yeah. they're looking at it like, goodness, I'd be 80 at that time. Right. You know, I, I would, my generalization might be that the older um, people might be less uh, interested in doing it. So the sol solar installers that I do a lot of work with say that that actually isn't the case. Remember, 28% of people our age were interested in putting it on their rooftop. And one of the drivers that I hear from the PV installers for people our age is the fact that we are getting older, but we want to make sure that we have some money available right now because we're still in the workforce. We're looking forward to what our operating costs are going to be as we retire, and they want to control those operating costs. Mm -hmm. So buying a solar PV system at this point in our lifetimes, you know, I have a home in Jaffrey, New Hampshire, that we'll be moving to eventually. That's a, it was built as a passive solar home with a great self-facing roof. So when we make that move full time to that property, that is absolutely first thing on our list to, mm -hmm. to do. And put in air source heat pumps, uh, ductless mini splits as well to heat the home because it's heated with propane right now, which is ridiculously expensive. And you combine those heat that heat pump technology with solar PV, you add AC to the home, but in the winter, you heat it much more efficiently uh, than you do with the propane. It's much less uh, cheaper operating costs. So that's something my wife and I, Sally, are really interested in doing when we make that shift. So that's a great question. Yeah, great question. Uh, markets responding. You can see there's a Better Homes and Garden Facebook post on this stuff. You know, um, some information on selling homes. You know, that's you know when when Stacy and I were talking about me coming to this company, the reality is we have an opportunity as Lear Real Estate to to Lear Realty Partners to really make an impact in this part of the marketplace that's rapidly emerging, and and I know that that was. Part of the reason why Stacy brought me on board to do this. I mean, this is the type of homes that I sell, list, you know, sell, work in the marketplace. But more importantly, we want Lair Realty Partners to be the leader in the Northeast in this type of sales, and we can certainly do that. There's no question about it. But it takes some time, energy, and and some uh, investment, yeah, in the knowledge to get it down. Uh, so just takeaways from section one. Why is solar PV suddenly part of the real estate discussion? Give me some takeaways. What did you What did you get from that? We shouldn't be so scared of it. Shouldn't be so scared of it, yeah. Why shouldn't you be so scared of it? Well, I think, again, especially from the training angle, it's, it's us ha having to understand it ourselves and then to present it to whoever our client is. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we all are realizing that we need to get a better understanding of it so that when the questions come up, we can be, be able to answer them mm -hmm. yeah. and, give, and give comfort and understanding to the clients because it's a big unknown. Yeah, absolutely. And what are some of the market drivers that has made it part of the Massachusetts discussion? Anybody remember any of the, the bullet points that we went through? Efficiency. Efficiency, yeah, lower operating costs, protecting against the volatility of the New England power marketplace. That's a driver, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Anybody remember any of the other drivers? 
A kushnik, you can throw your stuff in too. Mm -hmm. What else? State incentive, federal incentives, you know, right. tax yeah. incentives yeah. are drivers yeah. in this marketplace. Mm -hmm. Just the idea of clean energy that people are move, you know, that there are more and more people thinking about that being part of an energy and environmental solution, right? So those are some of the things that you're going to be running. If you if you're listing a home with solar PV on it, those are going to be some of the drivers that your homeowner was thinking about, right? And again, if we're competing for that listing in the marketplace and I can talk to them intelligently about the decisions that they've made and understand why they made those decisions. Where Courtney, before this class, if you went in and said, well, I'd be surprised if I can sell it because it's so ugly on the rooftop, I'm going to win that listing, right, is what it comes down to because I, I get it and that. you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So what if a buyer wanted to buy a house that didn't have solar and they wanted to get solar on this yeah. home? Yeah. How yep. can we um, advise them in that? So I, I would send them to energysage.com. Remember that website? Yeah, yeah. You know? So it's that's that's a good one to go it's to, right, because you let them that the solar installers that are out there. It's a good, solid Boston, Massachusetts company. Uh, we like them a lot. And they'll give three or four quotes for your you know, new homeowner mm -hmm. um, that, that is interested in putting solar PV on their home. Mm -hmm. And I, I think engaging, you know, when we're talking about how, you know, your, your buyer, right? Mm -hmm. They've worked with you for two, three, four, six months to buy a home, right? Mm -hmm. And they've developed a huge amount of trust in you as a realtor in this really important decision. And then what do we do after that, right? We send them Red Sox calendars every year and, and Patriots calendars. And by the time seven, 10, 15 years from now, when they go to sell, they're, they, they're getting Red Sox calendars from every realtor in town. And they can't really remember which realtor that they used, quite frankly, right? When we're engaging them with topics like lower operating costs on their home and that we are the agent that has, you know, I would prefer that you go through the green designation program mm -hmm. and add that to your name, but we know how to value that in the marketplace as well. Mm -hmm. That's got a lot more stickiness to it mm -hmm. than sending them another Red Sox calendar. Mm -hmm. right? So we are, um, they have qualified appraisers specifically for this. Yep. Do you think, uh, um, the, the, more, the lenders would consider like how they do a rental um, cost into the, the mortgage. Yep. Would they do something like this? Before? Absolutely. That's a great question. So you got to get the qualified appraiser, but then it's going to go on to a bank underwriter, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the project that I did in Fort Hill, uh, Jonathan Cantor was the builder developer for that Sage Builders. Mm -hmm. uh, he hired me early on in the process to put together a packet including his pro forma, but a packet about what the whole project was going to be about, which, which I did the work on, the lead certification, the net zero energy homes, you know, all of the pieces. It ended up being about a 25 page document. And we presented that to three lenders that he, he uh, thought would be good. Uh, one of them, Leader Bank in particular, a woman named Cheryl Glantz, who's their SVP for commercial lending, uh, really looked at that document. She had a lot of great questions and mm -hmm. you know there were lenders competing for Jonathan's construction project and mm -hmm. and Leader really stood out uh, among all of those. So that's who he ended up using for the construction loan. We're seeing if we present this information to lenders and, and um, that, they're, that they're also starting to get it. You know I, I was approached by a bank called East Bridgewater Savings Bank two years ago saying, hey, we're here, you're the guy through NAR that gets all this stuff. We want to uh, start to un understand this from an underwriting perspective. So I've had banks contact me. Mm -hmm. One of the things we've, so GBAR, Greater Boston Association of Realtors, which is where I'm a member, just started a sustainability task force that I'm chairing this year. So we, we're just meeting for the first time in February. And that's going to be one of the things that we're going to be looking at as a task force is how do we engage more and more lenders on this topic? Mm -hmm. Great question, great stuff. Mm -hmm. yep. Well, I guess that's very true and very forward thinking of that bank is for them to have the understanding of it. Yeah, because just like you know, people like me getting my green designation and being part of this marketplace, appraisers that have gone through this pretty rigorous set of classes to become mm -hmm. valuation of sustainable buildings, residential specialists, Lenders are seeing that there's a market opportunity there, right. 
builders are seeing that there's a market opportunity there, that there's a there there in the marketplace mm -hmm. now, um, which we've been waiting a long time for. But, you know, again, there's a lot going on right now politically that, you know, is driving all of this stuff to make it happen. We certainly, I, I mean, you know, not everybody has to believe in climate change, obviously, but there's no question that across the United States, NAR is looking at the topic of what's happening in Paradise, California, or the fact that in Puerto Rico, realtors have left the business because they can't make any money there anymore, or extreme weather events are happening mm -hmm. all over the place, and we know that they're getting worse. The, mm -hmm. the data is there, right? Mm -hmm. So we've got to tackle this problem. And, and NAR, I'm very proud to say, I'm very proud to be a realtor, is really looking in the, at this in a very forward-thinking way. Mm -hmm. yeah. so if Courtney, if I'm, Courtney had a question. Um, yeah. So, when you're about to list the house, you notice that they have the solar panels on their roof. Do you get an appraiser in before you even tell them the list price? Or no, what? no, because I can run the valuation on the PV value tool. This can be found, this neat little one pager here, yeah. gets spit out at the end. We can, with the installation agreement, get the data that you need. We're gonna talk about this if we have time at the end of the class. You guys have asked a lot of great questions, but you've really screwed up my timing because of these great <laughs> questions in terms of my PowerPoint. But I'm gonna do the best I can to get to the end. But the great thing about the PV value tool is it spits out this one pager that I can, if I've got the installation agreement and the seller right there, we can go through what the contributory value will be in the listing appointment. And then you're going to walk in after me, Courtney, and have no idea what the hell this PV value tool is, right? <laughs> and again, I'm going to win that listing, you know, because I have a specific of what the additional contributory value is. Great questions. All right, so uh, let's go on to section two and talk about the parts and the pieces of a solar PV system, because again, as a buyer's agent or a listing agent, you need to know how these systems work. And, and it's not really that complicated. This is a picture in 1984 of the first solar PV array in New York City, believe it or not. Yeah, in 1884. I already yeah. have a question. Yeah, so good. If a client is considering installing solar panels, yeah. how, would, how would you advise them or not advise them about whether their roof is already 25 years old? Do they? Well, first of all, I would let whoever they contacted at energysage.com give them that advice, right? I, I can certainly say that most installers in the Commonwealth won't be putting solar PV on a home that has a roof older, older than 10 years old. Okay. So one of the great times to look at this is when you're replacing a roof, okay. obviously, you know? I mean. That's a good yeah. question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in the winter time, do you have to go on the roof and like, Take all the snow off? Yeah, so cleaning sol solar panels in general, not only in the winter, but, you know, is there, you know, an, a birds flying by that are pooping on the panels, you know, dust from roads, all of that kind of stuff. In general, because we live here in the Northeast where we get a lot of rain, we're gonna get two inches of rain tomorrow, right? That cleans oh, yeah. everything right off. Yeah. The solar panels take in a lot of heat because they're black most of the times as well. Mm -hmm. So that it tends to melt off more quickly than the rest of the oh. roof. Uh, so in general, that's not a concern here in the Northeast. Now, if we got some big ice storm that had a layer of two inches of ice on it, you know, that would be a different story, obviously. And right. hopefully we don't run into that kind of situation. Mm -hmm. but with the amount of rain that we get here on the Northeast, it tends to clean the panels pretty efficiently. Okay. Other parts of the United States, not so much. Yes. Uh, so let's talk about the basics of a solar PV system, how they work. So um, this is... Uh, uh, a uh, graph from uh, National Renewable Energy Laboratory, which is again, one of our 16 national laboratories in the United States. You've got these individual solar panels on a rooftop. When they're connected together and they're wired in series, that's called an array, a solar array. You could have, like the project in Weston, we've got a set of panels on the back uh, garage that's facing Southwest and on the front, home as well. So we've got two different arrays in which I have to run two of these and add them up for the total contributory value because they might be facing slightly different directions, which is one of the inputs that we have here that determine the efficiency uh, of, the, of, of the panels and affect the, the valuation process, right? So a group of panels connected together is called an 
Array. 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 Exactly okay. right. Individual panels, you know, I don't know, four by five. They usually supply these days. You can get panels that are producing, you know, 325 watts of energy per panel connected together in series. They're called an array. They all run to an inverter. See where that little inverter uh, mm -hmm. picture oh, is? Yeah. Okay. Now we're going to talk about a, a central inverter, sometimes called a string inverter. There are also things called micro inverters. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But most of the time, you're going to run into a situation where you have an inverter that's next to the breaker panel blocks. It could be inside or outside the building, but it's close to that breaker panel blocks. Mm -hmm. The job of the inverter is to, is to switch the direct current power that the, that the solar panels are producing into alternating current power, DC to AC power, because Edison won that fight with Tesla back you know, in the day. We use AC alternating current in our homes. The panels produce direct current power. The inverter's job is to switch the DC power to the AC power. You got it? Yes. That's the most complicated piece of this, all right? But it needs to be there. That inverter needs to be there. Then the power runs into the home through the electrical box, right? And the home uses the, the electricity that's being produced. And we have homes now that are running completely on electricity. And that's a whole thing, right? That back in the day, we used to be really worried about electric homes because they were going to be so expensive. Well, if you're running, you know, the traditional electric resistance heating, it's still expensive. And in fact, it's even more expensive because the price of power is so high here in the, in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. But there's this new technology called heat pumps, air source heat pumps, ductless mini splits um, that are part of the Massachusetts marketplace now that run on electricity and they heat and they cool their home. And they're much cheaper to operate than oil or propane on a home. So even that, given that we're, we're so used to thinking electric homes, oh my God, that's so bad. We have to rethink with the new technology that's out there. Sometimes the home is producing more power and you can see on the diagram here, sometimes it runs through the meter. That's a net meter. That's the meter that quote unquote spins backwards, right? So the standard meter only measures the amount of power coming into the home from the power plant and it measures the number of kilowatt hours that you get billed on a monthly basis, and they send you a bill. Nobody understands what that bill means, but you pay it and you send it back, right? Yeah, the net meter can run in the opposite direction. So sometimes you are grabbing power from the power plant, but sometimes your solar PV system, the power plant that you put on your rooftop, is producing more power than you're using and it's sending it back to the grid. So that's when the meter starts to spin backwards and you get credits for the excess power that you've supplied to the grid wow. on your utility bill. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool stuff. Mm -hmm. That's why that net zero energy home, they only paid 434 bucks to do all of the stuff, wow. including their EV vehicle, electric vehicle. So you, do you see, notice that um, certain um, areas do better as far as getting um, extra Reserve. Well, uh, like town, states, and yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, we, we're up here in Massachusetts, yeah, right? So One of the northernmost, you know, yeah. areas in the United States, and we've got we're, we're I think the 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 number two or three producer of solar PV in the really? country. Oh. California, New Jersey might be us. There might be another state, but Florida, because they have such a crappy net metering policy, mm. you know, where you would expect that you would have all of the solar PV opportunity mm. because the political will is different and they haven't, you know, engaged it the Based same way that our state has. Mm -hmm. it, 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 you know, it's, it's not as a, an effective a policy. So policies are, are a big part of this. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No question about it. Great question. So here's a, a, a more close-up picture of an inverter, a central or a string inverter that you might see in a home. And again, that's going to be close to the utility box. Now, what's the inverter's job again? It's to... Change the um, DC to the... AC, AC power. Susan, I think at the end of the day, we're going to have to meet up for a sapphire martini straight up with a twist on me for getting that... <laughs> question right. That's exactly right. To change the direct current power that the solar PV panels are producing and turn, turn it into alternating current AC power so that the home can use it. Excellent job, Susan. Mm -hmm. Here's an exa another example of an inverter, just so you know, 
you're going to see this not as as commonly here in the Commonwealth, but you could run into a home where there's solar panels on the rooftop, but you go down to the basement and you can't find an inverter. So what's going on with that? They have what's called microinverters. So each of the panels has their own individual inverter and they don't need the central string inverter. Mm -hmm. You run into that more rarely, but it is something that you just need to know about. We having fun yet? Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Exciting. All right. So here's <laughs> here's some stuff on warranties, and I can send you all too. We can we could post the PowerPoint for people, you know, in in career den someplace. I, I don't know particularly how to do that. So yeah, it would be nice maybe you yeah like yeah. I mean, too. you can email me too, yeah. you know, and, and just say I want the PowerPoint, no, we'll and I'll send it right to you. You know. Yeah. But you can see some of the typical warranty times here, right? for different parts of the system. Mm -hmm. Now, this is an emerging marketplace, right? So I do want you, when you're representing a buyer in particular, and you're in the due diligence phase of representing them, purchasing a home with either leased or host-owned solar PV, to ask them, we, we want to get the power purchase agreement, the ins installation agreement, we want that coming from the listing broker, and I want my buyers to call the inverter manufacturer and the solar PV producer to make sure that they're still in business, oh, right? Yeah. Because it's an early phase of the marketplace and we've mm -hmm. seen examples of inverter manufacturers going out of business, right? Mm -hmm. So we just wanna make sure as part of the due diligence process that our buyers are checking in to make sure that those warranties are still valid and out there. And if they're not? If they're not, then we've got to factor that into the negotiation process, right? I mean, that's something that as professional realtors, that's now an opportunity for me as the buyer's agent to bring this up and to talk about how we're going to deal with this topic in the transaction. But just that thought alone is a, is a conversation that the listing agent could have with the seller to make sure that those people I would. Buying, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I would going into it, there's no question about it, but most likely, you know, our agents, if they're representing a buyer, are gonna run into a uh, listing agent that isn't knowledgeable and competent in this part of the marketplace. The way the four of us here now are, and I don't know how many people are on in Kushnet, but they're now knowledgeable and competent in this marketplace as well. But most likely, right, just like all of you, you had no clue that any of this was out there, right? Right. Is that fair to say? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so, yeah, do you have a question, Joe? Did you have a question? Um, so, again, this just reinforces that. Due diligence, just make sure that the buyers are doing their due diligence on warranties and making sure that, that uh, those businesses are still going concerns. This is a picture of a net meter. Looks just like a regular meter, but this is the meter that spins backwards, right? You can see it says net on it right there. Uh, but it looks just like a traditional meter, but this one actually does spin backwards. It doesn't go in a, di a different direction. And most likely, unless there's you know some kind of battery storage system and you're completely disconnected to the grid, if you've got solar PV on the home, you're gonna have a net meter on the home as well. All right, takeaways from section two. Tell me what you just learned. What are the parts and pieces of a solar PV system? The inverter. Inverter, right. And what does an inverter do, Susan Lewis? Looks pretty. <laughs> Turns DC to AC. Yes, exactly right. Now I'm gonna have to give up multiple <laughs> sapphire martinis straight out with a twist at the end of the day. Perfect. And and a bunch of panels connected together are called a array, array right? Yeah. And what is the funky meter called? It's called a... The funky meter? Yeah, rather than just the traditional meter, the meter on a, a solar... A net meter. And what makes it funky? What makes it unique? It can, can spin backwards. It's the meter that quote unquote spins backwards. Yeah, Joe? How much does an inverter cost on average? Great question. So we've seen inverter costs drop quite a bit in the marketplace. Right now, you're looking at about 2,500 bucks for an inverter. Now it depends on the size of the inverter, right? And in the Weston project, we've got two inverters for that property because we've got a really big 14.6 kW system on that, 
on that rooftop, on those two rooftops? Great question. All right, good. Moving forward, to own or not to own? That is the question, all right? So let's take a look at the next um, piece here. The, the differences between host owned direct ownership of a solar P PV system, and TPO system, third party owned systems. Who buys and owns the system? Obviously the homeowner and the host owned system, and the third party company owns the system in the third party owned uh, setup. Are there any upfront costs for the homeowner? Well, if you're purchasing the system outright, yeah, you're paying for the full system. If you're using a third party installer, most likely not in Massachusetts. There's a reason why as homeowners, we get calls three times a week from PV installers that we wanna put PV on your rooftop because it's really economically viable for those third party owners and it costs nothing you know, to do it. Who takes advantage of all the federal and state taxing credits? The owner does. And that's why the third party owners are calling you to put solar PV on your rooftop because they get to take advantage of all the federal and state incentives, which again, in this state are very, very lucrative. Mm -hmm. Who's responsible for the maintenance insurance of the system? The whoever owns the system, obviously the homeowner, if it's host owned or the third party owner, if it's third party owned, right? Maintenance for these systems, there's no moving parts on these systems as well. Very low maintenance, right? Mm -hmm. And insurance, we've got a specific um, frame on that a little bit later that I'll, that I'll fill you in on the insurance piece as well. Who receives the ongoing incentives like the SREPs in this state? So solar renewable energy credits last for 10 years and SRECs are now going for $320 to $400 per SREC. A five kilowatt system will produce six of these annually. You'll get a check from the utility company for at you know three, let's say three hundred times six. That's eighteen hundred dollars a year right now in the marketplace that you get a check from the utility company for because they're purchasing your green power that you're producing uh, and taking credit for it because of the renewable portfolio standard. So we're gonna get into the dynamics of this. We're gonna break it down a little bit more specifically, but you're gonna see very, very clearly that the benefits of owning a system in Massachusetts are very, very clear as opposed to, as opposed to third party owned. That doesn't mean that, that power purchase agreements are bad though, or we shouldn't be looking at them from, from the perspective of a buyer buying a home that they, add, that they, that they lower the operating costs of the, of the, of the home buyer. Uh, but it is much more beneficial to purchase the system outright in this state. Impact of solar PV on property value. Well, we've discussed this already. Uh, for the host owned system, it's considered real property under Fannie Mae guidance and it has to be appropriately valued. And we use the PV value tool to get use the income approach to add the value onto the property. For third party owned systems, it's considered personal property and the appraiser can't add any contributory value. But that doesn't mean that the buyer wouldn't see value in a good per power purchase agreement, right? It could be, and in fact is a lot of the times where the, the, because the price, the utility price is so high in the power purchase agreement, the buyer's only paying 60 cents on what they'd be paying the utility company for the same amount of power that's being produced but we can't add any contributory value even though there's value there for the particular buyer if we're guiding them through the process appropriately. Uh, point of sale. So getting back to uh, Courtney's question way, way back at the beginning of this. Great question. Third party owned systems. They've put something called a UCC-1, a Uniform Commercial Code-1, to protect their ownership interest at the registry of deeds on the home. It's been subordinated under the mortgage that was originally there. The problem has been that once you sell the property and the first mortgage gets removed, the UCC-1 moves to the top position and no lender on the face of the earth is gonna be subordinated to a UCC-1, right? right? So that can be a problem, something that we have to be very, very aware of when we're helping a buyer purchase a home 
with a power purchase agreement, with a lease system on it. We have to make sure that the installer is aware that there's a closing coming up and they're, they're going to remove the UCDCC-1 and resubordinate it under the new loan. So that's the sticky part. And four or five years ago, this, this was a real problem in the marketplace in Massachusetts when, yeah. when these homes were first starting to transact. Less so now. Yeah, so they take on the lease, those buyers? Yeah. Yes, yep. Yeah. That's an option. We're going to talk about some of the different options. If we have, you've screwed me up so much with time because you're asking <laughs> such great questions. But we, if we have time for it, we'll definitely talk about the options that are out there when you're running into a lease agreement and the options that the buyers have and the sellers have to deal with, with any of the issues that might Can pop you just up. just have the sellers take it off? That might be an option. We'll talk right. about that. Great Thanks. question. Great <laughs> question. Absolutely. Could be, could be an option. Depends on the power purchase agreement. Power purchase agreements are like offers, right? There's good and bad ones out there, right? So now we're also going to have to learn if we're involved in these kind of transactions, the differences in power purchase agreements. Oh my God, so much stuff to learn. But this is the deal when you're, mm -hmm. when you're selling these types of homes. All right. Um, so next slide. Let's go through kind of a typical example of what a PV system costs to install on a home and what the, why, you know, what, what are the, the elements here that make homeowners go, you know what, I'd rather purchase that than pay nothing and lease it, right? So let's say we have a five kilowatt system on the rooftop. The installation cost is done in watts, and a kilowatt is a thousand watts. Mm -hmm. Might be, let's say, an average cost at $4 per watt installed. We can find lower costs in, in the Massachusetts marketplaces. <coughs> Not atypical to find something in the high threes right now. But let's just use easy numbers. So that, that system installation is $20,000. See the math there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You get the one-time federal tax investment credit of 30%. So that's $6,000 off that. Mm -hmm. You get the Massachusetts uh, state income tax credit. So that's $1,000 off that. So now you've got a net of $13,000 that you're paying for the system minus the, the investment tax credits, okay? There's, if you own the system, you're gonna own these SRECs. Mm -hmm. Remember when I said this five kilowatt system will probably produce about about six of these, and right now they're going between $320 and $400 per SREC. Mm -hmm. So let's use three, $300. That's $1,800 a year that lasts for 10 years that you're getting back from the utility company in the form of a check. Mm -hmm. 10 years, that's $18,000, $15,000, $18,000. We're already mm -hmm. at a place where we paid for the system in 10 years or less. Mm -hmm. But wait, there's more. You're paying, you know, you're paying 24 cents per kilowatt right now. Let's use an easy number like 20 cents per kilowatt hour, which most customers in the Commonwealth would, would kill to get right now. And this home is producing 6,000 kilowatt hours of power. That's an additional $1,200 in savings a year in the savings and utility costs. Mm -hmm. So now you're looking at a return on investment <coughs> in five years for the system mm -hmm. with these assumptions and they last for 25 years. I wish I could make these kinds of investments on a day-to-day, -day. The, the investment, you know, when you look at this from a return on investment, it's incredible to own these systems outright. Make sense? Mm -hmm. You with me? Yes. Yeah. So that's the, you know, that's the drivers in the marketplace. It's just a, it's just a, smart, just a smart decision to make. Third-party owned versus host-owned solar PV, pros and cons, initial cost, maintenance by a third party are big pluses for third-party owned systems. And again, you know, I'm, you know, there are great examples of when a homeowner would enter into a power purchase agreement with, with, a, with a third party owner. But in general, in Massachusetts, if you can afford or you can get a loan to purchase the system outright, it is a no-brainer to do. You know, the, the economics of the system just make a lot of sense. Um, like offers, there, there are good and bad ones with these power purchase agreements. So let's take a look at some of the power purchase agreements that are out there, what they actually look like, and some of the things that you're gonna need to know as a listing agent or a buyer's agent 
representing a homeowner that has a lease solar PV system on it. And what you need to what you need to kind of figure out in terms of explaining this to potential buyers uh, that you're working with or or as a listing agent. This is an example of a power purchase agreement of a property that I sold in in Melrose this summer. Uh, as you can see, the agreed upon price. Uh, that the homeowner was paying for the clean power that was attached to their rooftop is 12 cents per kilowatt hour. What did I just say that the price per kilowatt hour was in Massachusetts right now? National Grid, it's 24 cents per kilowatt hour. So this homeowner is paying 50%, five, 50 cents on the dollar of what they're paying the utility company for clean power coming into their home. Just, you know, it's a smart economic model. Now I've seen power purchase agreements in which they were underwater, in which the price per kilowatt in some of the early days were higher than what the utility, utility company charges. So that's something that we have to understand. And, you know, with the, the, the attorney, obviously you want the attorney involved in this as well to analyze these documents and take a look at what's going on. But that's, that's typical in Massachusetts right now that you're going to get a pretty good deal on, on, uh, on the price per watt. You're going to see that there's late charges just like there are for the utility company. If you pay late, you're going to be charged for it. Yeah, this goes back to what, uh, what uh, Courtney was asking. Can you have the PV panel system removed at the point of sale? Depends on what's in the power purchase agreement. But if there's an estimated system removal charge in there, then yes, you can. You want to make sure that there's a UCC removal and refiling fee. I don't care what that fee is. I just want to see it in there because then I know that the, the third party owner knows they have an obligation to remove the UCC-1 and refile it underneath the new mortgage at that point of sale. Right? I think I went through one of those. Yep. Um, there will be in many power part purchase agreements, not all, a annual escalator. So although that might be 12 cents per kilowatt hour in year one, it might go up by 2.5% every year for the 20 year lease. So just make sure that's in there and everybody understand, understand what's going on with that. There's gonna be the specifics of the, of the uh, site and design assumptions um, in the power purchase agreement. Security filings, we already talked about that. UCC filings and resubordination, subordinating, subordinating under new loans is really important. Roof warranties will be in the power purchase agreement or installation agreements as well. There'll be some kind of roof warranty in there as well to guarantee that. Moving on to the next frame, you can see this is some really important stuff. Transferring your lease and selling your home. If you sell your home, you may or may not transfer the, to, to the new purchaser. I've never seen a power purchase agreement in Massachusetts where you don't have that option, but I guess there could be one. This, this comes from the Solar Industry uh, Information Administration, SIA, that has a, a, a prototype of a PPA online that I pulled some of these things from. The transfer will be subject to conditions. FICO score, minimum FICO score, if it's 700, and you're working with a FHA buyer that has a 660 FICO score. What do you do then, right? Mm -hmm. Call the installer, because that's one place where we've had a history now of solar PV loans that are out there and power purchase agreements that are out there that have very low default rates, much more than what they anticipated back in the early days. So you might find that the third party installer is willing to negotiate on that 660 FICO score, even though it's 700 in the agreement. Check that out. So that's a double for the buyer. First of all, he has to get pre-approved with this bank with the appropriate credit score and the appropriate program. Yep. And then he has to worry about being approved with the FICO score. That happened with, yep. my, with a cl my client who buy a client. Yep. You can if, you know, so when, I, you know, I've represented several buyers that are purchasing homes with power purchase agreements. The first thing that I want from the seller in the listing agreement, because they haven't uploaded it into the MLS, is the power purchase agreement. I have to see that. We review it with the attorney and the buyers. The second thing I'm doing is calling, you know, in this case, it was uh, um, uh, 
Solar City, which Tesla bought out. So I was contacting the Tesla person that that was in charge of this particular power purchase agreement. We were on top of that with the attorney on our side every single day to make sure that they knew exactly when the closing was. We got written uh, um, uh, in in email form. We got it in writing that uh, Tesla was going to re remove the UCC dash one and resubordinate it. They did the credit check on the on the buyers as well. Mm -hmm. Buyers passed without any problem, but that is an additional piece of this. There's no question about it. Yeah. Yep. Will there be a transfer fee? Who will pick that up? Is it going to be on the buyer? Is it going to be on the seller? That's something you need to negotiate. Is there usually a transfer? Fee? Yes. Yep. The assumption of the contract by the purchaser, can, can they assume it? Which uh, most of the time they can. If you sell your home, you are or are, are, are not permitted to move the solar system to your new home. Ooh. That could be an option in a power purchase agreement if you stay within the same utility load zone. So if you move out of state, they're not gonna, the third party installer is not gonna take that option. But if you're moving from Tewksbury to Drake it and you're in the same load zone, they, the, the third party owner might be willing to move that PV system to the new rooftop. So that's another option that could be in there as well. You may also have the option to purchase the system outright as the seller or as the buyer. You will never see an option to purchase the system outright until the system's five years old. The reason for that is that the third party installer when they've taken that investment tax credit, as an investor, if they don't own it for five years, they have to give back a portion of that investment yeah. tax credit to the IRS. So you'll never see less than the five year par 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 point of ownership in a power purchase agreement, the, the, the opportunity to purchase it outright. Yeah. If it's more than five years, that would be definitely a conversation I, as the listing agent, would have with you as the seller, maybe we want to purchase it right now so that we can add the contributory value into it and it makes the whole process a lot easier to deal with. Is it at a reduced rate after the five years? Or yeah. Anything go, uh, yeah, absolutely. That, that will be in the power purchase agreement what the terms of that are. You usually will see that at the five year mark, the 10 year mark, the 15 year mark, the 20 year mark, that'll be set, spelled out in the power purchase agreement. Mm -hmm. There's some power purchase agreements, and I'd love to see this in every one of them. I'd love to see Massachusetts Association of Realtors get behind legislation that would say, after year five, the third party installer has to offer the opportunity for the seller to, to purchase the system at the point of sale. Mm -hmm. I would love to see that in there. But that's not necessarily the case in all power purchase agreements. But there are several in which that is an opportunity. At the point of sale, the, home, the homeowner can purchase the system. And then you've, you've delivered real value to the, uh, to the, to the buyers. Now, the, in the power purchase agreement, even though those SRECs, those solar renewable energy credits last for 10 years, mm -hmm. I can 100% guarantee you that the third party owner is gonna re retain the rights for those SRECs even though it's, it, it may be less than 10 oh, years yeah. because they're so lucrative. So mm -hmm. that won't be something that the buyer gets to pick up. Right, oh, exactly right, yeah. yeah. Um, Fannie Mae guidance on third party owned systems. We've already talked about this a couple of times. It's personal property. It doesn't get included in the appraised value of the property. Solar PV and your home insurance. So this, again, information from Energy Sage. Uh, in general, you're not gonna see that there's an additional rider required uh, for home buyers or home sellers that are purchasing these solar PV systems. But obviously, as part of your due diligence, you wanna check with your insurance company just to make sure that that is, in fact, the case. So, takeaways from section three, to own or not to own. What did you take away from that? Own. Own. <laughs> yeah, there's no question about it. But does that mean power purchase agreements are bad? No, but it, it's, it's complicated. You gotta understand the elements that are part of the, you know, you gotta learn what a power purchase agreement is. You gotta make sure the UCC-1, you're coordinating that with the th third party owner and making sure that's removed and resubordinated. You know, and then with my buyers, the, the, this particular um, uh, lease that you're looking at like right now was a property that I ho sold this summer in Melrose, and it was three years into the ownership of that system. 
The homeowners, who are two architects and they get solar PV and the value of it, already have the money set aside so that in year five they're purchasing the system outright from, mm -hmm. from Tesla. Can't they just roll it over into their next mortgage of their other house? You could do that, absolutely, depending on the lender, of course. But yeah, absolutely. so you can take seconds, you know, to purchase these systems as well. There's a company called um, Sun, Sun Gauge in Boston that does specific um, um, mortgages for purchasing solar PV systems uh, entirely, and they've got really good rates. So there's different ways that you can do that, absolutely. All right, so the basics of marketing one of these homes. Ooh. All right, key concept. This is now a hybrid transaction. Just want you to remember that, right? When we went to real estate school way back in the day, remember when we took those 30 hour classes, we were told that there were three ways that we could appraise value on a property. There's the comps, right? The comparative market analysis. There's an income approach to property that we've been talking about with the PV value tool. And there's the cost approach. As residential realtors and appraisers, we immediately forget about the other two and all we think about are comps, 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 comps all day long, right? But commercial appraisers and, and real estate agents understand cost approach and income approach as well. So this becomes a hybrid transaction. This is a residential home, so it's obviously a residential transaction, but the homeowners put a power plant on their rooftop, right? So it's kind of like a commercial transaction as well, right? Using an income approach mm -hmm. to determine the value of that power plant that they put on their home. So it's more complicated than we're, than we're used to dealing with, but that's just part of the deal. Again, I am available for referrals, Courtney, if you need me for, for uh, <laughs> this type of home. Um, RISA, so the Real Estate Standards Organization, I'm going to do a deep dive into the MLS world right now, which is probably more information than you ever wanted to know about what's going on in the MLS. But we have 698 MLSs the last time I looked in the United States, right? So most consumers think multiple listing service, it's one thing. Nothing could be further from the, the truth, right? We have multiple MLSs here in the Commonwealth as well. The biggest one is MLS PIN, but there's Berkshire Realtors MLS, there's Cape Cod and the Islands at MLS. There, there, you know, all, there's multiple listing services all over the United States. And unfortunately, all of those MLSs look at the data points in different ways. In fact, uh, how we calculate square footage can be different from MLS to MLS. So this real estate standards organization was formed seven or eight years ago to standardize the data sets in MLSs across the United States. And one of the things that they've take, taken on, their board of directors passed in July 2016, the data fields that we want to see in MLSs for, um, for solar PV. They're at the bottom. How is it owned? Is it third party owned or host owned? And again, now in MLS PIN, those two data fields are in there. You can check the boxes if it's host owned or if it's third party owned. You want to see those checked. The year that it's installed, the system capacity, the nameplate on the system, 5.3 kW system, uh, 8.6 kW system. We want to see that in the MLS and the estimated or annual power production. Those are what RISO has as the standard fields that all MLSs will be implementing when they, when they add the solar PV data fields. So MLS PIN will be RISO compliant when we add the rest of these data fields uh, sometime in the middle of uh, uh, 2019. So we go on the listing, we should put these fields in a questionnaire with an appliance. Absolutely. With the Absolutely. Data. Absolutely, 100%. You've got it exactly right. Now, one of the things that we could talk about too, Susan, in terms of education of our agents, you know, we have uh, 78 green data fields in MLS PIN. It's one of the most, Kathy Condon, who's the CEO and president, has been a thought leader in the green data field world. She's, she's an outstanding leader in, in the MLS industry. And we could do kind of a green data field uh, um, review for everybody, you know, for our agency. So this next uh, piece is from from the LBNL uh, work that I had the opportunity to participate on. So I have a company called Sustainable Real Estate Consulting Services, and I get a lot of billable hour work. 
one of the things that LBNL did as a project for the U.S. Department of Energy was to take a look at three areas in the United States where we could look at auto-populating these data fields in the MLS. And one of the places that, we, that was chosen was Massachusetts, and I got to run the Massachusetts part of this. So right now we're looking at, because we know listing agents that aren't knowledgeable and competent in this part of the marketplace are gonna leave these fields empty. And that's a real problem in the marketplace. So what, what we're working on right now is a way to auto-populate those data fields. So if 123 Main Street in Tewksbury has a system that was, in, uh, that was installed in 2015, it's host owned, it's a 5.2 kilowatt system and it's producing 5,800 kilowatt hours annually, that would auto-populate with the address nice. match in the MLS. It's critical. This is another project that I'm working on right now called Helix. Uh, Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnerships is running this. They're creating a database from, from New York up to Maine that houses all of the green data field information. So again, it would auto-populate in the MLSs from New York up to Maine because we're just seeing too much of a gap there in terms of listing agents not getting the, the, that it's important to fill these fields. Um, all right, so in our MLS, we only have two of those fields. So we use in the remark sections ways that we describe the solar PV parts of this, right? I'm gonna show you some quick ways that you can end up in real estate jail by following some of the examples that I'm gonna pull from, from MLSs. These MLSs came from across the United States. Solar panels cover the electrical expense. Why is that a bad thing to say, do you think? It's not always true. Not always true. When would it not be true, Joe? I agree with you 100%. When Give me an example. Third party, I would say, because yep. you're technically still paying them. Yeah. Just paying half of what you would. Yep. And it may be true for the current owner, but there's an implied guarantee mm -hmm. that this single man that buys pizza all the time, doesn't cook and you know shuts off all his lights and takes five minute showers, mm -hmm. owns the property. But there's gonna be a family with two kids that take 45 minute showers and don't turn their lights off, right? So you're making an implied guarantee in that statement that the solar, the, the solar panels cover the electrical expense. May be true for the current home buyer, but it may not be true for the, uh, for the, for the her current home owner, but it may not be true for the future home buyer right? Yeah. So be very, very careful of that kind of language. You can mm -hmm. talk about your seller's experience with solar PV, but don't do any kind of implied guarantee mm -hmm. that the future home buyer is going to be experiencing the same results, mm -hmm. right? Solar PV system's been installed to give you an unbelievably low electric bill of 5660 per month. So again, this is an implied guarantee. And this is probably a homeowner that is in a power purchase agreement and they've got a great uh, deal with that power purchase agreement because, you know, on average, we're paying double that for, for electrical charges in, in homes throughout the Commonwealth, right? But the reality is that the power purchase agreement probably has an escalator in it. So that rate might go up by 2.5% next year. Now you've implied a guarantee for the future home buyer. That's what they're going to be experiencing. That's just getting you into real estate jail by, by making those kind of guarantees. Yeah, Susan? So as in normal situations, could a um, buyer or a buyer agent ask the owner of the home for what his costs have been in the sure. last? That would be a better yep. way to do it because it's actually the seller's direct knowledge, not you implying something. Right, mm -hmm. right. But as, as a, I, I would just make sure that if I'm the listing agent or if Lair is listing a home with a solar PV system on it that we don't want to get Sacy in trouble, oh, right? Absolutely. So you could say solar panels cover the electrical expense for the homeowner. For the present homeowner. Right, yeah. right, for the present homeowner. You know, that, that would be fine to say something like that. Right. Just don't imply a guarantee right. that that's what the future home buyer is going to be experiencing, mm -hmm. right? Brand new solar PV system on the rear roof provides the future homeowner about a 50% reduction on the electric bill. At least they say about, so that's good. We like that. But even that kind of situation, because the way residential end users use power in their homes varies so completely 
um, you know, that, that makes me worried mm -hmm. uh, all by itself. Yeah. The other Susan? thing is MLS Olden allows you to use the word new the day of installation. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so on to the next. So what do we want to do? We want to mention the, the, the static system characteriz char characteristic char characterization. Yes. And facts uh, about the, about the system. Is it leased or is it owned? We want to see that someplace in the remarks. How, how, what's the size of the system? When was it installed? You know, are, you know, is there years left for SREC reimbursement? Because how we deal with that is going to be a negotiating tool as well. So for anyone listening, we had just gone over um, a buyer, was that with um, Eloni yesterday? Uh, questions to ask a seller when you're meeting with them and about to list their home. So these are wonderful things that should also be on that form that we were talking about to include. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I would agree with that. Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, going back to Susan, your your point, your your question early on, provide essential information like warranties, power purchase agreements, mm -hmm. upload those mm -hmm. into the MLS so everybody is aware of them before you put in the 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 uh, offer on a property. Mm -hmm. It's okay to indicate the seller's experience with utility cost savings. Average monthly electric bill for last 12 months for this owner is only seven dollars and seventy six cents, including AC all professionally installed in 2014. Love that. Yeah. Just make sure there are no guarantees of cost savings that are implied to the future home buyer. Solar panels make it an energy efficient home. Is that true? Yes. That's no. Well, that's what people, that's <laughs> You're wrong, Courtney. Okay. <laughs> that's what people think, right? It is. Solar yeah. Energy efficient. Yeah, but really solar panels are producing energy, right? Mm -hmm. And energy efficiency is reducing energy consumption. Mm -hmm. So solar panels don't make an, an energy efficient home. But many times, if a homeowner has gone through the process of putting solar PV on their home, they're probably going to have gone through the Mass A program and added insulation and air sealing work to their home, bought more energy efficient uh, uh, furnaces, but it doesn't guarantee that solar panels make it an energy efficient home, mm. right? So there's a difference. One is about reducing resources, making using resources more efficiently, and one of them is about production of power. So probably the less we say, the better, I mean, to cover ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, kind of, but yeah. you, you also, if you're listing one of these homes, there's going to be questions about them, right? The actual you, facts. And, and you gotta, you, you got to be able to be able to yeah. talk the talk of, of solar PV in the marketplace. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like I said, it's kind of like you need not only a real estate license, but you need, mm -hmm. you know, a, a degree in energy management and procurement mm -hmm. to do this kind of stuff, mm -hmm. you know? It, and it's just the way it is and again happy to work with anybody yeah. in the company the first time through the second time you get through it it's a lot easier to deal with believe me and you can go back to this PowerPoint too mm -hmm. you can give me a call you know you can you can we can connect and, and try to solve problems before they happen right. 5kv solar panels owned outright and installed in 2014 all right so there's elements of that I like no electric bills and the solar system earns mass SREC credits potentially netting thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. Stuff I like about that, stuff I don't like about that. What, what is it that uh, you see in there that you like? Pretty much everything except no electric bills. No electric bills, mm -hmm. bad, 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 mm -hmm. absolutely. Even the SREC credits potentially netting thousands of dollars, that, that, that can be accurate. Yeah. 5 kV though, I don't like that because it's five, we express things in kilowatts, not kilovolts. Mm -hmm. Small k, big W, so I know that the the listing agent doesn't know everything that they need to know about this. But the no electric bills is what freaks me out too, Joe, I agree. Now this one has two of my pet peeves in it. This green home has solar panels. You see that one? A, it's the listing agent that puts everything in caps. That drives me crazy, just personally, it drives me crazy. And they put green in quotation marks. Like, you know, this home's good if you're a tree hugger. You know, <laughs> we're past that phase of the marketplace. This is just a smart economic incentive. So I just think that's a terrible way to, um, to market this type of home. This 1,382 square foot house, so I'm, I'm picturing a ranch house, has a 52,000 kW lease system. Now, remember, I'm thinking 5.2 kilowatt system or a 5,200 watt system. 
This is like a solar teepee over this little ranch house, this 52,000 kW system. This is, uh, this is definitely utility scale solar PV. So that's one, you know, just mm -hmm. inaccuracies in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So what are the do's and don'ts? Let's just review this section. What do you know now that you're never going to do when you're listing one of these properties and put this in your remarks? You're never going to um, give actual savings amounts. Or... Yeah, I don't. Well, I don't mind you giving the actual savings amounts as long as you say this is the seller's experience. Yeah, no We're like... not going to guarantee mm -hmm. and or imply that this will be the results for the future okay. home buyer. Mm -hmm. Right? That's mm -hmm. the big one. Um, how to establish a list price for a host-owned solar PV home? Where Susan wants me to end at eleven, uh, and it's ten fifty-seven right now. So I, I'm going to run through a couple of quick things. I, I'm going to jump to the end of this where we have a resource that will make sure that we post in, in, uh, in the Lear Career Den. It's a 45 minute video that I shot with Keep Me Certified, who's the vendor, the online vendor for the, for the presentation for, for the two hour CEU class. And we did an additional 45 minute um, um, supplement to that course that will put in the career Dan about me taking Jeff Weiss through the process of using the solar PV value tool. It's complicated. There's information on here that you're going to need to get from an installation agreement. You do this a couple times, it'll become very user friendly. When I teach the green designation course, that's a two day designation course, we do PV value tool at the end of day one. People leave with a headache at that mm -hmm. point because it's so much information. But they come back the beginning of day two and we run through it again and they get, get it. it. Yeah. yeah. So you do, you do it a couple times, you can get it down. Three approaches to value, right? The market approach, comps, income approach, and cost approach. Um, blah, blah, blah. Okay. PV value tool, that, that little uh, graphic on the left. Sometime this summer is going to turn into EI value tool. This is owned by a company called Energy Sense Finance in Temp Tampa, Florida. They're doing great work on this stuff. Again, all of this has been approved by the Appraisal Institute. This is accepted in the marketplace. But the cool thing about EI value tool, which is a, a beta test right now, is that it will include things like geothermal and uh, solar thermal and energy efficiency improvements and cost savings through HERS ratings and, and third-party verified certifications on homes. That will, will be able to use the tool to also create an income approach for value for not only, only PV, but for the rest of this whole value chain as well. So that's really exciting to see this tool kind of come to fruition. But right now, you'll go to pvvalue.com. It'll take you to just the PV part of this. Hopefully by later this summer, it will automatically take you to EI value and you'll have opportunities to do a whole bunch of different analysis on the types of properties that I'm listing. But you'll still be able to do solar PV on it, just like we've been working on now. So key concept, contributory value. You know, it's not just about comps right now, right, with these homes. This is a hybrid transaction. It's the combination of a residential transaction and a commercial transaction because you're adding a power plant onto the rooftop and it's creating income for the homeowner. So we have to make sure we know how to do that. Uh, that's where you find pvvalue.com, free to use. Just go to www.pvvalue.com. You sign up for it, free to use. Experiment with it, try it a couple times, watch the video, I'll show you where that is. There's a set of resources that you're gonna to need to use as inputs to go through pvvalue.com, and it's gonna spit out this one pager like you see right here. All of the assumptions that I input to create the value are on this sheet. That's really important for the appraiser because the appraiser may not agree with the assumptions that Ooh. I've made, right? And they have a right to reevaluate, or, or the, the, the buyer's agent may not agree with the assumptions that I've made. And if they're, they're smart enough to know how to use the tool, they can calculate it on their own and argue against the value that I've come up with, right? But the appraiser has the ability to do that. It's all transparent. It all gets spit out in this one pager at the end of it. SRECs. So you can see that this is available in some states and not others. Let's say Susan Lewis owns a, solar, owns a home with solar PV that she purchased five years ago. So now there's five years of these SRECs left, right? 
that are coming in at maybe $1,500 a year. What happens with those when you transfer to the new buyer? They will automatically transfer to the new buyer and they'll get checks in the mail. They have no idea where they're coming from, from the utility company because nobody's explained it to them. Mm. But Susan might have the option to contact her SREC broker. So you have a broker that actually runs this SREC that goes to the SREC auction marketplace and they might give you 60 cents on the dollar for those remaining SRECs, right? Maybe that's a great option for you that you can take that in cash. But do you do that before you list, list the house? Absolutely, you'd want to make that call, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then when the buyer asks, what about my... So this is the discussion, right? <laughs> so I'd love to have a buyer's agent or a buyer ask that because my response would be, well, we're going to get 60 cents on the dollar, you know, so we think we're going to go that route, but we could hold it off. We, we don't have to purchase them right now. And if we have a problem with a home inspection or something, you know, maybe we use that as a negotiation oh, tool, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, so now th there are different ways that you can handle this, yeah. right? If you're a savvy listing broker that understands how this marketplace works. For this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We'll do that. Okay. Yeah. Is this fun or oh, what? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Man, this is a good time. <laughs> so going to the end, um, you can see the link to the course supplement up there, deep dive using PV value tool. That's where you'll see the 42 minute uh, demo on going through the PV value tool. We'll post that on, on Lair Career Den. There is gonna, so I'm writing a course manual for all of these frames that MassCEC is gonna publish on their website. So there's gonna be a written version of this course as well that we're working on right now, it's not complete. So that again, you can have it as a resource when you're thinking, oh my God, this is so overwhelming, all of this yeah. stuff. You have some resources to go back to to be able to use. Yeah. It's big stuff, mm -hmm. you know, trying to figure this, this all out. But believe me, I, uh, I'm really glad that you guys came to this today because it's, it's part of the marketplace right here, right now. And we have to be knowledgeable and competent in terms of dealing with this stuff in the real estate transaction. Even the attorneys too. You would Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Are you set? I think so. Are we good? Yeah. Any other yeah. questions? Does Kush not have any questions, Joe? Are okay. we all set? You, you guys all set? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you very much. All right. No problem. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Thank you.